relatively large Ceph cluster that's primarily doing erasure-coded storage. Um, yeah. So this is where I'm based. Um, this is the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in uh, Oxfordshire in the United Kingdom. Um, there's a bunch of relatively large experiments on site. We, uh, we sort of, they're mainly sort of particle physics experiments, um, but they have a whole host of users, people that um, sort of biologists and chemists come and use them um, to study, study the things they're studying. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of research, and there's a lot of world-leading research that goes on at SDFC, and we need world-leading computing to actually facilitate that, and that's where I come in. I work in the scientific computing department, and my, my role is primarily providing storage for the uh, Large Hadron Collider experiments at CERN. So, yeah. So, um, the LHC experiments at CERN produce a fairly ridiculous amount of data. I think this year they're meant to produce around 50 petabytes of data. Um, and all of that data needs to be stored somewhere and it needs to be analyzed. Um, the WLCG, the Worldwide LHC Computing Grid, was set up with the aim of doing exactly that. Um, so it's a collection of sites around the world that are involved in the storage, in, yeah, the storage and analysis. Um, we're one of the biggest sites involved in this project. We have over 30 petabytes of disk storage um, and then tape storage and analysis machines. Um, currently around 10 petabytes of our storage is Ceph. Um, that's, what, that's what I'm working on. Um, and yeah, and as, as we go on, more of that storage will become Ceph as we start ramping, ramping that up. Cool. Um, no, I've also, on the map there, um, I have the Institute of High Energy Physics is just over the other side of Beijing, um, and they're also involved in the collaboration. So what do you actually need to provide if you're wanting to provide grid storage? Um, it's pretty simple for the most part. Traditionally, um, the storage was all, um, it was hierarchical file system-like storage. Um, there's no real need for that anymore. We've, um, the experiments have moved away from using that sort of stuff. For the most part, they're just using the storage as, a, as an object store. Um, so one of the things we were looking at when we were looking at sort of replacing our storage um, was whether we could use an object store, and that was one of the reasons why we started looking at Ceph. Um, yeah, this is very much high throughput computing. We're not talking about high performance computing here. Um, the problems are, for the most part, embarrassingly parallel. Um, they're broken down into very small parts. So um, we're not particularly worried about sort of single stream performance. We're not particularly worried about latency. Um, yeah, there's no, there's no user interaction going on here. All of this is jobs that have been scheduled. Um, so yes. Um, and then lastly, there are a few non sort of mainstream protocols that you need to support to actually um, work in the grid. Um, specifically, there's grid FTP, which is used for external transfers, um, which is yeah, shuffling data between sites. And then XRoot D is used internally, which is the jobs will be fetching data off the storage. Yeah. So, um, yeah, back around the release of Firefly, we started looking into using Ceph uh, for, for this role, replacing, replacing our disk-only storage. Um, right from the get-go, we had an incredibly tight limit. Um, our pound per terabyte limit was um, low, and we weren't going to be able to push, push that. So there were going to be a couple of caveats to using Ceph. Um, mainly, we were not going to be using replication, so we were looking at erasure coding from the beginning. Um, we were always going to have large storage nodes. We weren't going to have a nicely specced um, Ceph cluster for lots of IOPS. We were going to be looking at sort of 30, 30 plus drives in each storage node. Um, and we weren't going to have other nice things like SSDs for journals um, and all of that. It was going to be, everything was going to be co-located co on the data disks. Yeah. So um, the way we ended up supporting the grid protocols we needed to uh, was using writing our plugins directly on top of Librados or on, on top of Librados Striper. Um, 
we had to help some help from CERN doing this. Um, they were interested in using it for a different reason, um, and so we were able to collaborate on that and make sure we got what we needed. Um, yeah, we did try and get experiments to use S3, um, but there was definitely limited success in that. Um, that's always the goal um, with this. When we have new people coming on and using it, we're go trying to push them towards using industry-supported stuff, get them using Rados GW. Um, it makes our lives easier, and it means that we have a less custom solution in the end. So yeah, oh, and at some point during the whole process, we came up with this acronym, um, so it's called ECHO. Um, yeah. So um, this is a quick diagram of how we actually get data in and out of our Ceph cluster. Um, so to start with, sort of on the right-hand side, that was basically all we had. So we had our cluster, and then we had a couple of external gateway machines, which were just big machines with lots of networking um, that ran all of the protocol servers that we needed. Um, so the external sites, um, data coming in and data going out, would go through them. And then data going onto the worker nodes for the analysis jobs um, would also go through those external gateways. Um, this wasn't ideal, and this was something that was quickly identified as being a generally bad idea. So we um, wrapped up the, uh, the X3D server with the plugin and the various things it needed, ceph.conf, um, and a, the correct key ring um, into a container. And now that runs on all the worker nodes. So when a, when a job requests files um, on one of the worker nodes, um, it thinks it's speaking to the external gateways, but there's a little bit of host redirection that goes on, and it means that it ends up just speaking to the local gateway and then never bothering our external gateways, um, which works really well, actually. Cool. So um, this was the first lump of storage we bought for um, we, we bought for Echo. Um, yeah, um, there's not a great deal to say here. It's fairly standard. Um, it started its life, yeah, started its dual. Um, we quickly upgraded to async messenger, uh, sorry, to uh, Kraken because we yeah, had a lot of problems. Um, I will talk about them in more detail on the next few slides. Um, and then it was upgraded to Luminous recently. Um, yeah, there's nothing particularly interesting uh, with this hardware. Um, we were aiming for about a hyper-threaded core per OSD and enough RAM per OSD. Um, and that was really all we could afford. And so that was what we got. Um, and yeah, it gave us 13 petabytes of total raw space. So um, we had some decisions to make when we were coming up with how we were actually going to do the erasure coding. Um, and this was obviously back in 2014, 2015. There wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of information out there about what people were doing uh, with sort of large scale um, erasure coding. So we spent a lot of time messing around with this and getting things to break and then finally getting things working. Uh, we ended up with um, yeah, eight data stripes and three parity stripes, which gave us an overhead we could afford in terms of we could buy enough storage to meet the pledges we needed to meet um, and gave us decent security. We were, sit we were starting to see issues with RAID 6 on our um, existing system. Uh, we were losing data because things were breaking in rebuilds um, and so being able to being protected against three failures was a lot better um, initially we were interested in going for a higher number of data stripes obviously the higher the more data stripes you have the smaller the overhead is for the same amount of data security um, so that was something we were interested in but what we found was that it was very hard to keep a cluster actually stable um, when you've got these placement groups that contain 19 OSDs each. Um, yeah, things didn't work very well. Um, that, this was, again, pre-async messenger, so this was on dual. Um, things m have changed, I won't talk about that. Um, the rest of these settings are very default. Um, we were already taking a fa fairly large gamble by using erasure coding at this time. There wasn't a lot of people using it, um, and it seemed it seemed sensible to stick with the things that most people would be using so that we hopefully weren't the first people to run into things when things went wrong. Yeah. 
Cool. Um, so yeah, a little bit about what our pools are actually made off of. So our largest data pool is uh, just over four petabytes now. Um, and so that's four petabytes with yeah, 2,048 placement groups. So we've got yeah, a little bit over two terabytes of data per placement group, um, which is fairly large um, compared to what a lot of people are doing. Uh, it does make things like deep scrubs take well over an hour, which can be a bit annoying sometimes. Um, and this is something that we're, we are looking at. We will be increasing this number, um, and we're going to be aiming for around one terabyte of placement group, I think is a reasonable thing. Uh, one of the things that bit us early on is if, you're, if you've got very large sort of EC placement groups um, with lots of OSDs in them, um, the recommendations for how many placement groups you should have in your cluster don't necessarily work particularly well. and You end up with far too many placement groups or you end up with each OSD being part of far too many placement groups, which can lead to serious performance issues. So yeah, um, in terms of the sort of having so much data in each placement group, we're not seeing any issues. If everything works well, we're getting the throughput we need. Um, and yeah, from that respect, it's working fine. Um, what we were seeing issues with um, in the early days was actually just the amount of communication that is involved in a large placement group like this, when you've got 11, 11 OSDs needing to communicate with each other in order to actually peer that placement group. You, what we ended up with was we were in a situation where peering would actually cause OSDs to not be able to get that, the heartbeats wouldn't get through. And so OSDs would end up knocking other OSDs offline. Um, they, would go, they would be marked down. Um, this would trigger more peering. Um, and then that would knock other stuff offline. And you'd end up in a situation where you could never actually get a cluster back to active and clean um, because the amount of peer, the amount of traffic required um, to do that meant that the OSDs would then go offline, um, which was fairly obnoxious. Um, so we spent quite a lot of time tuning, um, sort of trying to figure out how we can stop that happening. Um, this was what worked for us, just essentially making them slightly more resistant to being marked out so, so early, um, and that made it a lot more stable. Say again. This was all. So this was all in the early days. This was in Joule. Yes. Um, so this was pre-async messenger. Things have got a lot better with async messenger, um, and so it would be, in a sense, it would be interesting to sort of try this all again um, with a luminous cluster. But we are where we are now. So. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this too long. There's not a lot of interesting information here. Um, yeah, our crush maps, we've kept them very simple. Um, because of the nature of what we're doing, we're not worried about trying to be as, trying to have as much availability as possible. Um, and so it was deemed acceptable that we would be in danger of losing availability if we lost power to Iraq. Um, that sort of thing doesn't happen often. Um, we've got dual power supplies in all of our racks um, and our networking is uh, redundant for the most part so we're not particularly worried about that um, but just in general having having the failure domain at the node um, does I mean coming from a system where you don't have that coming from a system where you care about every node um, it makes a massive difference um, and it yeah it's, it's a lot more a lot more nice to operate on a daily basis So I mentioned earlier that we use Librato Striper uh, for our yeah for our for our plugins to our external protocol servers. Um, when when the objects come in from the experiments, they come in at a range of sizes, um, and so it's yeah it, it makes sense to stripe these down to manageable numbers or manageable size of objects on disks. Um, Librado Striper, the, as I think was mentioned earlier, actually, the default stripe size for Librado Striper is somewhere around four megabytes. Um, this number makes sense when you're talking about replicated pools. You end up with four megabyte objects on disks, uh, which is a completely reasonable size. When you start talking about high, sort of large numbers of data stripes in erasure coded pools, you suddenly end up with very small objects on the disks. Um, 
So in this case, we would end up with 512 megabyte objects. If we were looking at higher K numbers, which we were, you end up with even smaller objects. Um, it suddenly means that you're incredibly dependent on how many IOPS you can do for what your actual performance is, um, which is something that, I, from, from the use case I've described, we're mainly worried about throughput. And so we did a lot of investigation into what, what, what should you actually do, what's a, what's a good stripe size to aim, what, what's, a, what's a good size of object to actually aim for that's on the disk. Um, and in our case, that meant going with Librad or Striper, striping things into 64 megabyte chunks, stripes even. Um, and then that means that at the end of the day, you've got eight megabyte objects on your disk. Um, yeah, which, which works for us. It was the, uh, yeah, the, it was the least bad option. It works fairly well. Um, yeah, and at that bottom point is just um, sort of basically what I've just said. Um, if you do have erasure coded, a, a large number of data stripes in an erasure coded pool, and you're using sort of default object sizes, uh, things get very small and things get very well distributed, um, which can be a problem if you then lose a placement group. You've suddenly lost a little bit of every single object in your cluster. So yeah, um, so I've sort of described a, l a lot of the decisions that went into actually making it and a lot of the, um, yeah, a lot of the considerations we had to think about. Um, and then I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about what it's actually like living with it um, and how it works for us. So I guess the first easy thing to talk about is, does it actually work? Um, and yes, it does work. Um, its performance is pretty good. Um, it will happily do um, yeah, over 10 gigabytes a second of sort of, of production I.O. Um, so this is, all of this is just actual production work. This is um, uh, collision files being pulled off the off Ceph and onto the worker nodes. Um, you see down the bottom, I'm not sure if you can read it, but that peak there was the first time we got over 20 gigabytes a second. That was a few months ago. Um, and yeah, Ceph is handling this fine. There is, it hasn't given us any indication of where we're actually going to see a bottleneck yet, which is pretty exciting. Um, it will be interesting to see how far it can go. Um, we've had all the performance problems we have had have been entirely or mostly due to um, the external gateways um, and that's things like um, badly thought out buffer sizes meaning like excessive memory usage uh, and port exhaustion due to misconfiguration um, that sort of stuff uh, so that's been interesting um, and the gateways on the worker nodes have been really really good um, being able to remove that bottleneck has uh, one meant the external gateways have a much happier life, um, and then we actually just we get a much more a much better performing cluster. Okay, um, so the other sort of performance you care about um, when you're running a cluster is what what's the backfilling like? Um, in again. In the dual days, we were seeing issues with the backfilling causing high load, impacting client I.O. Um, and we spent a lot of time trying to tune that down. Um, so yeah, this was some of the, some of the tuning we did. Um, yeah, we're in a much happier place now. Backfilling, can, backfilling goes on um, as part of the normal operation of running it most weeks. But we'll be doing something and um, it has no effect on client AI from what we can see. Um, we'll be happily doing 20 or 30 gigabytes of backfill traffic um, and 10 or 15 gigabytes of uh, client traffic uh, with no issues. Um, the bottleneck we do see when we're actually adding nodes um, is actually the networking. So the cluster networking of the node we're adding uh, will be saturated um, while there's enough PGs backfilling. Um, <coughs> which I guess is, is a nice place for the bottleneck to be. We can always improve that. Cool. So, um, this is, uh, yeah, this is sort of a taste of one of the operational issues we had in the summer. Um, so, yeah, back in the summer, we, we started, when we built Echo, we started out with 30 of the nodes and then added the remaining 30 um, 
as sort of an experiment of can we actually do this? Does this actually work for us? Um, what we ran into was this bug, uh, that tracker there. Um, and essentially, a, a quick quick rundown is when a when a erasure coded placement group is backfilling, the primary will be sending out requests for all of the shards uh, from all the other OSDs. If one of those OSDs can't read its shard, if there's a pending sector or something's gone wrong on the disk and it can't read the shard, it will reply and say, I can't read that shard. Um, and the primary, instead of being like, OK, that's fine, uh, I can still reconstruct the object, will just crash, um, which is really unfortunate. Um, and obviously, it will then be restarted and then crash again. And still, and then when systemd stops restarting it, the second OSD in that set will then sort of become the primary, uh, real, be like, oh, we were doing backfilling. Uh, and then suffer the same fate. So this, yeah, this this was interesting. This hit us um, fairly hard. Um, we ended up with multiple placement groups down over the course of an afternoon, and no clear idea of what was going on. While we were actually trying to figure out what was going on, we ended up doing some fairly drastic things to try and recover the placement groups, um, and we ended up actually losing one, uh, which was pretty unfortunate. Um, and yeah, so. Once we, once we got to the bottom of it um, and managed to start removing the OSDs that had any, any OSD that had a single pending sector, um, it turned into a bit of an operational nightmare. It's, it's been a fairly tough six months um, trying to deal with running a cluster, doing cluster operations, um, most of which will involve backfilling when you're in a state where any, any backfilling has the potential of bringing down a placement group and uh, yeah, removing uh, or yeah, reducing your data availability. Um, as of a few weeks ago, this is actually fixed, which is nice. Um, so yeah, when I get back, I will be upgrading um, as soon as I possibly can. Um, but yeah, so this, this was an interesting problem that we had. Um, so continuing on the theme of problems, um, this is the other main operational thing that we issue, that we get um, when we're running run a cluster, the thing, the thing that takes the most of our day-to-day -day time in terms of mundane things um, is inconsistent placement groups. So an inconsistent placement group is when deep scrubbing happens and the shards of an object don't agree with each other. Um, we get a fair amount of these. Um, most of these, or in fact all of these, um, without fail, have been due to a, there being a pending sector on a disk. So a, a disk has a sector that's become unreadable. Um, and so when the object, when, when the OSD tries to read the shard, it can't. Um, um, yes, I'd say probably nine times out of 10, maybe even more than that, this doesn't result in us taking that disk out. Um, healthy disks do develop pending sectors. It's just, they are, they are designed to work around them. The firmware will work around it. It will remap the sector. Um, so most of the time we will not be taking the disk out, we'll just be doing a PG repair which will just try and rewrite the shard, the broken shard and then re-scrub the placement group um, and then it will come back as health okay. Um, in this respect um, I think this is a slight complaint in the health error um, for what is a harmless problem on a, the, these types of pools seems like a lot of overkill. Um, it makes monitoring things like Ceph Health, if you're, if you're doing call-outs and everything, um, something that makes a lot of sense to call out on is the health of the cluster. Um, if you suddenly are in this state for over 10 hours a week, um, it's a bit of a nightmare. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something that's interesting. We've actually kind of got around that. We use the uh, scrubbing scheduling in the opposite way from the last speaker. Um, we actually schedule it so we only scrub in daytime hours. So we at least don't get woken up in the middle of the night. So yeah, so this is one of the things that's very new to us. Um, coming from our previous storage system, um, we never had to worry about disks um, sort of throwing pending sectors. All of that was hidden from us. Um, yeah, RAID, RAID controllers are very good at doing that. Um, they will they will try and repair a disk until it breaks, and then or until it's deemed broken, and then throw it out and it will be repaired. Um, yeah, 
a, it's a been a large part of our operational, just our operational work and our development work has been figuring out how we how we deal with these. Um, we've been coming up with short term solutions of pulling discs out as soon as they get pending sectors, um, and then essentially remapping them, re writing to the whole disc, reading from the whole disc, deeming it healthy, putting it back in. Um, this is a lot of work for what are single sectors on the disc going bad, um, which can be expected of any disc over its lifetime. Um, so having to move pet sorry, terabytes of data around for single pending sectors does seem a little bit, a little bit silly. Um, yeah, and this is one of the areas that we didn't expect to be putting work in with Ceph, um, and it's interesting that we are, and it will be interesting to see where we go in the future with it, uh, whether we get better at dealing with them or whether Ceph um, can get better at dealing with them. So, um, yeah, so back when we were f figuring out what we were actually going to do, how we were going to manage this cluster, um, the decision was made that let's just do it manually. Um, obviously, we're managing Ceph.conf, we're, ma we're managing the OSs, um, but Ceph itself, we're not using anything to generate our crush map. Um, this works okay for us. Um, we do a lot of part of Echo's yearly operations. There will be nodes going in and nodes, sorry, node, nodes, yeah, going in and nodes coming out. Um, yeah, we're going to be, there'll be new generations every year and we'll be retiring old generations every year. Um, so what we've, what we've ended up doing um, is we're using Ceph deploy for normal getting OSDs onto disks. And then when we're, thank you, um, yeah, when we're making changes, when we're doing reweights, um, all of that is just manual crush map edits. Um, yeah, it seems to work fairly well, and we're going to continue with it for now. So, um, the reason why we're doing this, the reason why we're not just using the Ceph tools provided, um, is that when you're making changes on the scales of thousands of OSDs, sticking things in for loops, um, results in a bit of a mess. You get sort of extended periods of peering and you get, um, you sort of, you lose the ability to roll back changes. If, you, if, you're, if, you do, if you're doing these, these sorts of changes and you get halfway through reweighting all of your nodes or all of a, a generation of nodes down to zero and you realize you've done something completely wrong, it's trickier to roll it back and it's not as quick to roll it back as just being able to push the old crush map back in. Um, so, yeah, have, being able to do manual crush map edits and then do a sort of a step change and there's just one recalculation and it's suddenly like, oh, yeah, there's 6% of objects misplaced. That's what we expected. Um, seems to be a much cleaner way to do that. It would be cool if there was a tool to do this. Um, I think this is something that would improve the usability, certainly for us. I'm sure other people would enjoy this too, um, being able to sort of batch up a bunch of changes on an offline copy of the crush map and then push that out in one go. Um, and you can make it as user-friendly as you wanted and you can do all sorts of fun stuff with actually analyzing what's happening, what, what data you're moving around. Yeah. Um, just a little bit about our data distribution. There's a histogram of OSD utilization there. As you can see, that's we've got a nice spread from about 85, 90 to 20. Um, so the cluster is around 60% full, um, and yes, we have an, a, a fairly impressive spread of OSD utilization. Um, but yeah, this is something that uh, I, I guess you can expect, um, but what we found is that sort of as we started filling up and needing to reweight the, the filled up OSDs down, um, using reweight by utilization is perfectly effective at keeping the, the ones that are nearly full um, moving them back into the middle of the pack but you never really lose the long tail you've always got OSDs that only have one or two placement groups that actually have data in them um, and it's a bit yeah it, it's certainly something that I think could be improved and that is one of the things that has been improved and so we've been looking at the balancer module um, which is new with Luminous um, and it does seem to, does seem to do, 
some things a lot better. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that works when we get it working on Echo. Cool. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, uh, we've had an we've had an interesting first year. We've been in production for pretty much exactly a year now. Um, we've had we've had things that have gone wrong, and we've had things that have gone right. Um, Seth has definitely handled things we've thrown at it. Um, it's yeah, it, it's going to be really exciting to see how Seth handles us putting a lot more hardware into it. Um, Echo is. So it's currently around 10 petabytes. It's going to be around 30 petabytes in a year's time, year and a bit of time. Um, and so it's gonna, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how the performance goes, um, improves with that. Um, there's also some things that I'm not so excited about. Um, I'm not really, I don't really see the issues we're having with disks doing anything but scaling up with the number of disks. Um, and then especially as we start having aging generations of hardware in there. Um, yeah, as, as hardware, you've got five-year-old hardware um, and brand new hardware in there, how you deal with that. Um, so that will be fun. Um, yeah, and then I think finally, um, sort of to sum it all up, um, using erasure coding, er erasure coded um, Ceph on large storage nodes is definitely working for us. Um, it was, yeah, a bit of a gamble when we started. There was some questions that we weren't quite sure where, which way they were gonna go. Um, but we've got a lot more confidence and it's clear that Ceph as a community is getting behind erasure coding um, with uh, yeah, RBD on erasure coding um, and CephFS on erasure coding. Um, there's going to be a lot more people using it and that can only be a good thing for us. So yeah, uh, thank you.